we're on. At this time, I'll call this meeting of the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society to order. My name is Richard Conkle, and I'm the society present, president. Um, do we have any first time visitors with us today? And your name is? That's me, of course. Okay. Are you here because of the speaker, or what, what drove through you to come and see us today? The subject. The subject. Well, we're very glad that you could join us today. I think January the 2nd is the date that is the closest to New Year's Day that we ever get <laughs> with having a meeting. And over the past couple of days, I spent a little time looking at the history of New Year's Day because I knew January the 1st was not always New Year's Day. And it was very sort of interesting. We, as genealogists, think back to our ancestors and so forth, what they may have done on these holidays and so forth. And um, being January the 1st actually goes back to the Romans, some of the Roman calendar, but then it changed various times. Initially, the Romans used March the 1st, then during Christian times, they used March the 25th. And those March dates make a whole lot more sense when you think of what the months of the year are. The month that we were just in is December, which means the 10th month. And so if you start in March, September through December are the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th months. And Romans actually changed it before Julius Caesar to um, January the 1st being the first month or the first beginning of the year. But they never changed the, the names of the months, which they were all off for over 2,000 years. But um, like here in British North America, technically, legally, um, the new year didn't start until March the 25th until 1752. Now, a lot of us have German ancestry in this area, and they would have used the newer calendar, which would have been the Gregorian calendar rather than Julian. And that did start with January the 1st. A lot of people were kind of mixing it up between the two. So some things to think about. What we think it's always the same isn't always the same. And of course, it was also the eighth day of Christmas, it still is the eighth day of Christmas. And I guess today's the ninth day of Christmas. So belated first day of Christmas greetings and happy new year to everyone. Um, I don't think we have a secretary with us. So I guess we will postpone the reading of the secretary's minutes until the next time we're together. Uh, at this time we have our treasurer, Margaret Burke, who I don't think was here last time, so she'll give us several treasures reports. Okay. Our treasures report is going to cover October, November, December. And the balance at October 1st, 2021 was $19,261.32. The October receipts, membership renewals of $100, new members of $100, and publication sales of $20 for a total of uh, receipts of $220. There were no receipts for November or December. Okay, going to disbursements, October disbursements were Pennsylvania sales tax of $25.44, Postal connections for the September October newsletter, $119.33, and to the um, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, a donation for Aaron McWilliams speaker fee, and that was $125. Total disbursements for October, $269.77. November disbursements, Scott Mingus for a speaker fee, $125. Postal connections for the Printing of publication number 86, $977.32. Staples for envelopes for mailing that publication, $56.66. That was going to also take care of another, public, uh, another mailing. That it was uh, enough quantity to go to another mailing. Uh, you, uh, U.S. Postal Service mailing publication 86 was $373.76. So November disbursements was $1,532.74. December disbursement, postal connections for the November-December newsletter, $132.65. Our cash balance at December 31st, 
2021 and the summary of the operating account amount is $17,546.16. Membership report, we have 147 members. We have five new members for this, this fiscal year. We have uh, 20 renewals just since September. Uh, we had quite a lot of that to have not renewed. Uh, we've made a couple of postcards to them and that to see if they'll come back, but I think they will after we get through this pandemic, hoping. We had three members who have passed away since September. Betty Dureus, Phyllis Fry, and a life member, Albert King. Thank you, Margaret. That, will, that report will be filed for audit. Um, at this time, we'll have Nicole Smith, the librarian and archivist at the York County History Center, to give us news from the York County History Center. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. If you're watching from home, uh, please remember that you can type comments and questions into chat or the comments if you're on Facebook. Uh, this webinar is being live streamed on the York County History Center Facebook page and recorded and will be available on the York County History Center YouTube channel. A uh, couple announcements. We're excited to announce that uh, newspapers.com has just uploaded a new batch of local 19th and 20th century newspapers from our collection. A couple examples are the Delta Herald, the Cartridge Box, Glen Rock Item, Hanover Gazette, York Republican, and York Democratic Press. Uh, to see the whole list, uh, please check our website or check with me after. Upcoming programs, our second Saturday speaker is Jimmy Rosen, who will be speaking on his book called Got Gas, Service Stations in Central Pennsylvania. Our York Civil War Roundtable is January 17th. The speaker is Bradley M. Gottfried, and he will be speaking about the Point Lookout Prisoner of War Camp. And our All Vets program is January 26th. And our speaker will be Ken Bear, a Vietnam vet. For more information about our programs and to register um, to attend, please visit yorkhistorycenter.org. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And at this time, we'll have our vice president, Jonathan Stair, give us information about upcoming meetings and introduce today's speaker. Okay, next month, February, we will be having Chip Kaufman come and speak about Pennsylvania's Celtic language heritage. So if you're tired of Pennsylvania German subjects, this is going to be a different uh, thing. And uh, Chip has a great knowledge of various languages, and so this will be very interesting. Special programs uh, beyond that, on uh, March the 6th, a local gunsmith who has a natural reputation, Brad Emmick, will be talking about 18th century gunsmithing in Pennsylvania, in Eastern Pennsylvania. And he will be demonstrating some of the things that he does, uh, bringing some objects and so forth here. So that's one that you want to attend in person if you can. And then we have a special opportunity on April the 3rd to go down to this window courthouse and our own Tom Gibson is going to be talking about the challenges facing the Continental Congress in Yorktown. And so we have those special things coming up. Our speaker today is Mark Schirmeyer, and I, I've been thinking about how to introduce him because I've known Mark longer than I've known my wife, so um, uh, there are a lot of things I could say. Mark currently is the president of SAA Architects here in New York. He's the founder of that and um, a graduate of Carnegie Mellon University and has been involved in architecture since he graduated from there. He's also served on the York Historical Architectural Review Board. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with this facility, Mark and I were student workers, employees in the late 1970s in the library under Lane Reisinger. And that's one of the times that Mark and I were together. But the very first time I met Mark was in high school when we played in the high school band. 
And Mark has a hidden talent. He's a very good saxophone player. Um, he was good. I was a horrible clarinet player. And the, I think the band director just tolerated me. Mark was an outstanding performer. Well, I don't know how to say that, but I haven't <laughs> touched it in like 50 years. So. <laughs> and me either. I don't think I've touched mine in 50 years either. So now we're going to have Mark Schirmeyer come and speak to us about a local um, group of family of architects, Demples. Mark. Okay. And thank you for inviting me here uh, to give you a little bit of background on this project with the Demp Wolves. Um, I started working on it probably around 1980. Um, it was at the invitation after um, I had worked here two summers at the, um, what was the Historical Society of York County at the time. I then worked for a summer of, I think it was summer of 1980 for Historic York Inc. There was a revival of interest in Victorian architecture at that time. Really, up until that point, everybody had been only really interested in colonial architecture, colonial revival, everything that came before the Victorian era. And there was starting to be this developing attitude that maybe Victorian architecture was worth learning something about, learning about the architects at that time, um, learning what they what they did and their motivations and everything. So historic York kind of invited me basically to come back another summer and start a research project on the Demples. Because at that time, there were some, some people who were around uh, who remembered the Demples, but um, that knowledge was generally becoming forgotten. Um, so I started that project um, basically kind of on my own, developed my thesis at Carnegie Mellon University with that, um, concentrating on a few of their buildings. And then that led to um, the slideshows um, that I had given frequently over the years. Now, of course, they're PowerPoint and they've been tweaked gradually through the years, but um, they basically will give you an overview as to who the Demples were, um, where they came from, what their motivations were, and, um, and, and basically their, their contribution to um, architecture in this region. And I would say there were three architects who carried the Demple name. Um, the first one who everybody was, was um, mostly familiar with was J.A. Demple for John Augustus Demple. And he, his name was, was on just about every work that the firm ever did. As a matter of fact, though it was a, a firm that at that very size over the years, everything up until the time of his death was, was noted as J.A. Demple architect. Um, he was born on October 3rd, 1848 in Merck's house in Germany. Um, he was the oldest of the family, very religious, very outgoing, very flamboyant. He was employed by PNS Small, where he became interested in construction. And in 1869, he apprenticed with to William Gutwald, who was a carpenter in New York, in anticipation of his employment in 1870 in the planning mill of Nathaniel Weigel, who was a building contractor here in New York. J.A.'s youngest brother was Reinhardt Jeff. He was the second architect in the firm and probably, as we will we'll discuss later on, um, really the most, um, the most educated, the most refined in design. And the pointer is... I'm to get a pointer. That's all right. I'm going to need it eventually. I'm going to okay. right now. But um, Weinhardt was the youngest of the family. He was very opposite in personality from what Weinhardt's son told me of his brother, J.A. He was very reserved, was a gentleman, very artistic. He was educated solely in York County, at the York County Academy and the York Collegiate Institute. He went to Philadelphia and studied sculpture for three years and then returned to York for a year or so. J.A. sent him to the École de Belles Arts in Paris where he was there for two years from 1882 to 1884. And after the École, he had an invitation from Whitney Warren to join his practice in New York. And Reinhardt declined that invitation because Jay's attitude basically was, and this was relayed by Reinhardt's son, I pay for your education, so you owe me. Um, so Reinhardt stayed in New York to work in Jay's office, and he always kind of resented that, and he always felt his talented, talents were very limited by staying here. Um, Whitney Warren, by the way, and a little bit of background on him, he was a cousin of the Van Vanderbilts, and the firm Warren and Wetmore was notable um, for works that included include, Dan, include Grand Central Terminal, which still stands in New York, and the Biltmore Hotel. 
So there was quite an opportunity there and quite a friendship that, that um, you, we can understand that went kind of unrealized. And then there's a younger picture of J.A., which would have been probably around the time that, that he started working and started to practice. The Demel family, all seven children were born in Germany. In 1867, they immigrated to the U.S. J.A. was 19 at the time, Reinhardt was six. Um, this photo is circa 1864. Um, there you can there we'll identify some of the names, the two parents, as well as Charles H. Jr. was the second oldest son. He was in the fertilizer business and established your chemical company which probably was one of the really financial um, engines of the family that supported the family, even much so and more so than, than an architectural practice would have, even in that day and era. Ernest was an engineer. He settled in Brooklyn, New York. Lena was a seamstress. Wilhelmina and Louise were two twins, and there were four additional children who did not survive in infancy. The, the Demple father was known for um, this windmill, which I understood stood in the Pershing Avenue area in the north end of York in the city where they basically ground, um, owned, I guess, into fertilizer. And that was kind of the, uh, the procedure then of what became the York, the York Chemical Company. The third architect was J.A.'s son, Frederick Grime and Demple. And Fred was born in June 29, 1885, he was educated at the York Collegiate Institute, MIT, the Occult Beaux Arts, the American Academy in Rome. In, 18, in 1911, excuse me, he entered JA's office for a year. In 1912, he left and was employed by Marshall Fox and Company in Chicago for 15 months. His experience with at that time uh, involved North Shore residences, hotels, country clubs in, in Chicago. He then was employed by Hewitt and Bottomley around 1913 in New York. He also got further experience with country homes, schools, churches. In 1915, he returned to York. 1917, he enlisted in the U.S. Army. In 1918, um, with the Army in France, France, he reached the rank of captain. And in 1919, he returned to York in J.A.'s office, where he then eventually inherited the practice upon J.A.'s death in 1926. And there's a picture of Fred in front of the uh, York Collegiate Institute that was in the Gazette and Daily prior to its demolition in 1962, which was, of course, one of his, you know, fathers and Reinhardt's, uh, you know, outstanding achievements, which unfortunately didn't survive the, the early 1960s as, as many buildings in that era did. It said that in the planning mill of Nathaniel Weibel, J.A. made full-size details of St. Paul's Lutheran Church. This was designed by Stephen D. Button um, of Philadelphia and later of Camden, New Jersey. And this is working with the in the plain mill with the details of this church is one of the things that supposedly gave J.A. his interest in architecture and his interest to, to basically go into design in the profession. Um, Stephen Button was the preferred architect for Small and Bill Meyer families. Other buildings he's noted for in York are the First Presbyterian Church, the Bill Meyer House at the southeast corner of Market in Queen. He was the, uh, Button was the preferred architect of many Philadelphia families who built in Cape May. Um, Stockton Place, Mainstay Inn, the Abbey. Uh, if you go to Cape May and you're familiar with any of the buildings down there, those are buildings that Button designed that, that are still standing. Button, and even in the time when he was doing his work in York and J.A. worked for him in the 1870s, was noted to be conservative, very behind the times, stuck really in mid 19th century Italianate and Gothic style design. One of the reasons that the, the, the families it's known in histories of Cape May that built down there were, were generally wealthy conservatives from Philadelphia. So rather than a Frank Burness, they hired somebody who was very conservative like Button and who wasn't known as being very progressive in architecture and was kind of stuck in that, that post-Civil War, pre-Civil War, Northeast style, you know, his whole career. In 1918, uh, Jay did do alterations to St. Paul's. Uh, and it's, it's also said, like I said earlier, that the drawings and designs of this church really awoke in him the interest. He worked as a foreman for a while and went to New York with his brother Ernest and Lena and where he took a two-year night architectural drawing and designing course at the Cooper Union Institute. 
1873, he graduated Cooper Union. He then superintended the construction of the Holy Cross Catholic Church Cathedral in Boston, which was dedicated in 1875. There's some pictures of Stockton Row, mainstay in some of the button buildings in Cape May. So you can see stylistic similarities there. And then this is Holy Cross. J.A. then returned to this area in 1874, and his first commission was the first St. John's German Lutheran Church. It was built for a cost of about $25,000. In 1940, the tower was renovated and shortened by the Dempwolf firm. It was claimed that um, a, typical to a lot of um, uh, the, the, you know, German, Pennsylvania Germans, they, uh, the Dempwolf family said that they really didn't maintain the tower and so by 1914, it needed to be topped and shortened. So the current tower design is a dental design, though it's a lot less dramatic than the original design. J.A. then didn't really want to stay in York, and he returned to Philadelphia to work then directly for Stephen Button. And they designed buildings for the Centennial Ex Exhibition. And then in 1876, Samuel Small really encouraged him to return to York. Yeah, I don't know what that's done. Okay. I moved the projector. There we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, technology, it's all great when it works. Um, and in 1876, um, he was encouraged by, by, by uh, Samuel Small to return to York and set up what was then really the first architectural practice in York and on this side of the, the Susquehanna River. Um, he set up practice in the cassette building which is, and if I can figure out which button works on this thing. Why did I have it turned it that way? Which is this building here in the square, which is part of the, it was replaced in the 1960s. It's part of the, the bank complex that currently is sitting empty there. You can see the facade of it. And then here is a picture of the Dempwolf office circa the 1890s. It's interesting and just some background in the office. Most of the architects of significance in York through the 1960s started out in the Dempwolf office. Uh, there was a competitor in BF Willis who basically had no um, attachment to the Dempwolf office, but pretty much everybody in this area had cycled through there at one point or another. Um, some of the names are Edward Thomas Keyworth, Keyword, um, Charles Augustus Keyworth, his brother, Robert Stair, um, Hom and Lever, who started the Hom and Lever office, uh, and the Hom Associates office, which until some form it had survived till fairly recently. And you can see Harry Yesler, who's well known in practice, Arthur Rosser, who's Reinhardt, a young Reinhardt, Beth Wolf, J.A., um, Al Aldinger, J.B. Rosser, J.B. Hom are in the back here. And this person by the name of Martin Bowers. Um, but again, just about everybody at one point or another cycled through the office. 1874, some of the early commissions, Zion Lutheran Church, which was putting a Romanesque facade on a, a, a much earlier pre-Civil War building, and that, that facade and church still stands. St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Hanover, this building was replaced in the 1920s, but this was a, a very eclectic mix of late 19th century Victorian Gothic and a kind of a Christopher Wren steeple kind of integrated to it. Um, interesting, not very skillful, but kind of indicative of the type of designs that J.A. Dempel liked. He was very much into Gothic, um, very much into Victorian eclecticism at that time. The firm, and, and we'll find out as we go through here, people used to ask the question of, well, what kind of style of architecture did they work in? Um, you will, it, it, when you look at their, their, the progression of their architecture, you can see just about every style that was popular that came and went as it became popular, as it faded from popularity through the course of the, the 50, 60 or so year progression of their firm. Um, another early building is the EUB Church in Hanover, which is where this photo was taken, was a, 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 a convenience store. But you can see the, the what was the, the apse of the building. You can see some simple Gothic details still surviving in the building. There is an old um, picture of the drawing. You can see, again, some of these, these details still surviving. And then finally, the, the first big commission for J.E. Dempel um, was probably the York City Market 
1878. And again, a very dramatic mid to late 19th century Gothic revival building with Germanic influences. It would always be interesting, and I thought it would always be interesting to study, to be able to get even more in depth in this, to study photos of the areas of, and the cities of Germany, such as Hanover and Braunschweig, Brunswick, that J.A. would have been familiar with in his childhood over there, and how that might have influenced some of his designs here. Uh, of course, we would have to look at it the way it looked in existence in World War II. But here are some photos of the, the, the market. The tower was one of the tallest in town at the time. Um, it reached a height, I believe, of 140 feet. It was much more dramatic and much more interesting, um, even in the York Central Market. These wings were added in 1886, and then later additions filled in the wings with these storefronts. The tower supposedly was struck by lightning. I don't have the exact date on that, though. I believe it was early 20th century and then was, was topped. And then some of these are, are photos that were taken right before its uh, demolition. If you see in these streetscape photos and of the Germanic cap timbering details and everything on the facade um, and the, you know, the overhanging cantilever cap timbered facade, but you can see all these influences in it. And, it, and it's a real shame that the, the neighborhood kind of uh, these were the monumental buildings that the neighborhood kind of uh, centered around. This in the, the, the York Collegiate Institute next door and um, what, you know, the, in the decimation of the neighborhood by removing these buildings. Um, these are some interior pictures. The, it said that the, the, the trusses were erected by a Baltimore shipbuilder. They were the largest examples, or so it's rumored, of Gothic hammer beam trusses that were built in the U.S. at the time that they were were installed. Again, a great loss architecturally for the city. Bill Dyes, who was the architect that kind of inherited um, Fred Dempwolf's practice um, at, uh, around 1960, uh, close to Fred Dempwolf's retirement, um, commented, you know, the, the, just the pattern of light that streamed through these triangular um, dormer windows, again, you know, the the patterns that they made on the floor were, you know, were, were absolutely outstanding. And you can see some of that. Again, like I said, much more dramatic than, than even Central Market. Another uh, building around the same era was St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Spring Grove. Um, this, when the building was replaced uh, in the uh, early 20th century, um, was dismantled and reconstructed um, in the county. But again, a very simple Gothic revival building. Again, it's similar in a lot of things, and we'll get into this a little bit later of what H.H. H. Richardson was doing nationally at the time. So you can see a photo of the building. Also, again, the Dumple firm worked not only in many different styles, but they worked, one of the primary um, project types with, with, that you see as we go through here were churches. Though they worked everywhere from residences to industrial buildings to schools to higher education facilities, there almost was, was nothing that they didn't do. And again, this is, is covering highlights from their firm, but there's a lot of things that, that they worked on and a lot of us, you know, even outstanding projects that, that aren't even covered here and haven't been, been thoroughly researched, researched because there's no really definitive list of everything that they did at the time. Um, this was also published nationally, but it's the early designs for the Spring Grove paper mill. Um, one of Dempwolf's chief um, benefactors, chief um, clients at the time, not only were the Smalls in York, but then with Gladfelders at Spring Grove. So they did many, many projects over the years that were funded by the Gladfelders, not only at the paper mill, um, there were extensions and um, uh, buildings at this complex everywhere from 1888, 1890, 1895, 1896 carpenter shop, rotary building on up to a boiler house in 1908. Parts of which are still standing, but again, you can see changes in stylistic treatment between the early buildings, which again, were more um, Gothic Romanesque in their inspiration and then some of the later ones. One of the early churches um, that's very interesting is Calvary Presbyterian Church. And this was a Richardsonian Romanesque revival that stands where the 1970s Christmas Addicts building now stands on South Duke Street. 
and was started with, by, by the Smalls, in my understanding, um, at the time to relieve uh, the, some of the congregational pressures on First Presbyterian Church. So they established a Presbyterian Church on the south end of the city, which was Calvary, and they established one on the north end. Um, the unusual thing about this building was the fact that the, and Demple used this a lot in their, their designs, the fact that you would, you would think typically a building like this, you would enter on axis and you would have a chancel as an apse at the long end of the, the axial long end of the building. This was termed the opposite. The apse and the chancel was put on the long side, so it's the short end of the building. You entered asymmetrically in the corner, so, so it, it, what it did is it got the congregation closer to the speaker and closer to the pastor and the minister. And it was a very aformal setting and encouraged a much more informal um, congregational experience. And it's very unusual. I was contacted at one point in the late 1980s when I was researching this by um, an author from Ohio who was doing research and you, you, and he had contacted the historical society here at the time, and they referred him to me. He said that this type of auditorium was very commonly seen in the Midwest in Ohio, but you seldom have ever saw it east. And so that's why he had encountered this in, in a, a publication of a, of a double building um, in a national publication. And that's why he then had reached out to York because he was, there's never really were quite pieced together other than seeing it in national publications where that inspiration came from and how it got used in York there. And you can see similar but then more formal arrangements. This was an unbuilt design for Memorial Church in Gettysburg, also in 1884, around the same time. And now I'm going to touch a little bit about architecture, the architectural precedents and, the, and what was going on at the same time that um, these dental projects were going on. This is the, in 1866, the Church of Unity in Springfield, Massachusetts, an early H.H. H. Richardson design. And while it's not Richardson Romanesque that he would later be, uh, be known for, it was this mid 19th century post Civil War Gothic style. And you can see elements of this again in those early Dumble churches that were done a decade or so later here in, in, in York County and in this region. And then with the Richardson Romanesque style, you can see elements that are reflected in Calvary, um, um, Presbyterian Church. You have more of the Ro Romanesque elements, which is the round arch for those who aren't familiar with that. You have um, a use of multiple colors of materials. You have this tower that is, is you know, a brown stone or a red sandstone tower that, that caps a base of a gray um, sandstone or granite material. So you're mixing polychromatic colors and everything in there. Again, um, the um, Trinity Church in Boston, Massachusetts, another well-known Richardson Romanesque design. Again, you're seeing the, the apse, and you can see echoes of that kind of treatment in, in the Dumple Church we, we pointed out. Crane Memorial Library, and this is very interesting, where you see this very mouth or cave-like opening to the, to the building. Again, Richardson kind of originated that, and you will see that recur in some of these higher and, and academic buildings that the Dumple firm had done. So again, looking at national uh, uh, details that national architects were doing and what was being published and then incorporating those trends and those changes of styles in their work. And look at this detail with the triple arches. Um, this was the New York, is the Senate chamber, the New York State House in Albany, New York. Similar, look at the capitals where you have these squat columns. You have, rather than a classical capital, you have a, a capital that has all sorts of organic details and carvings in it. You have very squat arches that are very heavy and, and very compressive in, in the, the entrance, the feel of the entrance. Um, this is a Richardson design Emanuel Episcopal Church in Pittsburgh, and it still exists. It was in the city of Allegheny at the time. You're seeing things like these triangular dormers you see recurring again. You're seeing a, a building where the roof itself and the volume of that roof is many, many more times larger in volume than the walls, and the walls become almost a, a buttress to that roof. As a matter of fact, these, these walls are very thick on this building. But when I saw this and photographed this in the 
the 1980s, these walls were, were actually kicking out some due to the compressive nature of this, you know, this expansive roof on top of them. Again, yeah, there very dramatically, you can see in Richardson's design how the whole back of the building becomes the axe. And of course, the Allegheny County Courthouse, which is probably one of the best in Richardson Romanesque revivals here in this area. And then you have um, the, the to touch on some school buildings that the Dentalks did, and then you will see how these styles kind of changed as they would take a style and they would kind of recycle it. Um, now, one of the first schools done was the High Street School in Hanover. And this took a very cruciform pattern. It's sort of a mixture of a Georgian revival building with the center hall, and you have basically regular A's with um, um, six over six large, six over six windows on either side. You have some Gothic details on the type of it. If you're starting to incorporate some of these round arch details with it, and then there, there's a picture of that school, a postcard photo of it. And then the Poplar Street School in um, Columbia, PA, which took basically the same design, same kind of Georgian revival design. But then you started to add these shaped dormers and some other kind of European influences to it. And you basically, this is this is a is basically two rooms on a floor, a land back wall to it, not a cruciform pattern. You're taking basically the same design as this front or simpler building and pulling this off, replacing it with a porch, you're adding other stylistic elements in it, and you're, you're simplifying the design. The one of the things that uh, you will see again and again in a lot of temple buildings is this, this love for a very gothic type of chimney on the end of the building that punctures through a door. You will see that again happen here, and you can notice that on residences and and, and uh, kind of a detail that is used over and over again in a lot of their buildings. Here's a, a picture from the 1980s. This uh, building in Columbia still stands as Hanover um, building was demolished in the early 1960s. It had been expanded quite a bit, and then was eventually demolished. But there you can see the the, the chimney that that breaks the corner spine and the dormers and creates a very vertical element. And you can say, even though things are trending more towards the Romanesque, but you can see Gothic influences with the verticality between the base and the first and the second floor. And then the same design, but transferred more into the Richardson Romanesque is the Princess Street School in York. You have the same kind of Gothic influence, you have similar in the sides, but this is 1888. The Columbia's building was 1884, but you can see the same details then kind of reshaped into a different style. Um, the porch itself becomes open. You have the use of the round arches. You still have this kind of center hall Georgian thing. But what's different is you have no other ornamentation on the building. Again, typical with the Richardson Romanesque and typical with the styles in the late 80s. You're using the contrast between the smooth brick and the um, rock cut sills. You're using brick cornices, you're using details where the, 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 the construction materials themselves are becoming in the raw form and their smooth form are becoming the ornament and the details of the building. And there you can see a, a more recent photo of the building. Um, again, this was probably 20, 30 years ago, but it still looks very similar, but you can see that the chimneys have been, been taught somewhat. It's very interesting, I include this, and this is in the, um, in the drawing collection here at the, the History Center. Um, but there is a drawing that survives of the outhouses, which were for masonry in the same Romanesque sort of revival style, which at one point sat out behind the building. So they, they spare no expense at the time, even on the on the, the toilet facilities. I always thought that was very interesting. And then taking the same style as Princess, but on the larger scale of the high street school in Hanover is the um, Stevens School in West Philadelphia Street. And then by this time, you have the entrance, which is that very Romanesque cave-like mouth entrance to the building. You still have sort of this Georgian plan, but you you have other stylistic elements of the Romanesque revival, these round arches, the use of the, um, the contrast between the smooth and the rock cut um, brownstone materials. Some older photos of it. This is before the restoration and or, or rehabilitation, I should say, in it. There have been some intensive changes made to this building since the tracks credits expired and 
Um, the uh, I believe York area housing group did a rehab of this in the uh, in the 1980s. But again, you can see, you know, this this label around the round world and arch. The only details, the only kind of organic details are the, the ends, which turn into a kind of a loop-like pattern. This is very interesting in that the, the, the building you, you went down this, this this hallway and then in this part of the building you had um, the very beautiful iron staircases that went up on, on either side of an open hall. And to touch on some other things that they were doing at the time, um, this was the Mary Forney residence in 1885 in Hanover. Again, you kind of still have a center hall design, but you're adding these kind of uh, three part, almost modified Palladian window elements um, to the facade of the building. This was the Hanover Opera, Opera and Market House, which survived into the 1960s. Again, a Romanesque revival building. This is the E.J. Wolf House in Gettysburg. And by 1883 to 1886, when this was, was designed and this was published, you can start to see more of these asymmetric elements, which they kind of identified as the American Queen Anne, which are, are mixing and matching elements of various styles in the building. And you're starting to see, even though you're mixing it, you're seeing a, a difference in sophistication and, and changes in the design. <clears throat> One of, the, one of the most outstanding churches, and it's been variously well-preserved and not so well cared for over the years, is the Center Presbyterian Church in New Park, uh, built in 1886. Again, <clears throat> Romanesque design. You can see much like the Emmanuel Church at Pittsburgh, you can see the roof predominates even the walls of this building. And they've had issues with the uh, recently and over time with the walls being pushed out by the roof. And again, the building had a very asymmetrical entrance. I think the churches and senses would change this recently where, where rather than entering on axis, you, you entered even the porch at the side, you went off axis and then you entered the back of, a, of the auditorium that, that had a very intimate and short shape because you were you were um, entering kind of at the corner. You weren't entering a long axis with a long kind of processional um, axis in the, in the auditorium. These are other shots of uh, Center Presbyterian. Again, all very indicative of the, the Romanesque style. And really in, in this kind of style, the, the, there's not a lot of ornament and the change in the contrast of the materials through the ornamentation of the building. And all these photos were, were early 1980s before some of the region changes, and there, this outhouse building still stands on that property. <clears throat> and then we get um, to the building that sat beside the um, the York City Market on South Duke Street, which was the York Collegiate Institute, which was the forerunner to York College of Pennsylvania. Again, one of the most notable, notable Richardson Romanesque buildings in York, it didn't survive the early 1960s. see various details in all the building. And then you have the same kind of apse thing and, you know, but it's occurring in classrooms on the edges of the building. Or you can see the center um, Memorial Hall, I believe they called it, which was a memorial to Sam the Small. Um, but you can see the same kind of triple arch detail, very similar to what you saw with the arches at the upper gallery of the Senate chamber, Richardson Senate chamber in, um, in, in Albany. Another photo of that prior to the demolition of the building. One of the, the classrooms in the, in the back of the building. Just some various other interior shots. The interiors, these are very typical of, of the era of the building. And then this is a, a shot of the building not too long before demolition. The, um, the gymnasium, um, which still stands, was built in 1916, again by the Dental firm. And then there were various other additions and changes in the building over time. Fortunately, a lot of the details that were present in the York Collegiate Institute still survive in some manner um, with Gladfelder Hall, which was for PA College in Gettysburg, which is now Gettysburg College. This was 1887, several years after the York Collegiate Institute, where the York Collegiate Institute supposedly 
was designed to kind of conform with the foundations of the previous building, uh, which had burned down. Um, this building didn't have those constraints, and so it was a much larger, grander building, but you see many of the same kinds of elements we've talked about. You see a central tower, very similar in detail, entrance very similar in detail to the York Collegian Institute. Other shots of it. And then again, these were shots years ago before this building was expanded. You see these, these peak dormers, which again, you see the same kind of detail on the Colonial Hotel down the street here. Again, very typical Richardson Romanesque entrance. And this is interesting that you start to see, and when you look at these things, you can see the um, just the organic nature of the uh, what is happening in these capitals, such as the face, such as I like to point out, there's a dragon curled around its tail. Here, you can see the foot, the tail, the head. Very creative. And some of this around this time, after 1886, would have been when Reinhardt was back in the firm. And you remember, he was trained as a sculptor, he was trained in Europe and much more formally trained. So you start to see a very higher level of, of sophistication of detail start to happen in these buildings. And you can start to see um, Reinhardt's influence with the way these buildings are detailed and with the sculptural influences with the buildings. And then also with the other architects that had some kind of formal training and were starting to apprentice and work in the building. This stone here, this JED stone, and you still see several of those around town, but it's T square, um, his initials, a compass, and the, um, the usually the date of the building. This is one that doesn't appear on every Dumple building, but that only appears on certain ones. Again, this side porch um, at Gettysburg College at the Gladfather Hall is very similar to the two flanking front porches at the Collegiate Institute. So at least an example of that detail and detailing still survives. And then you see all sorts of, of interesting things, such as the, and the very organic nature of this kind of architecture where the, the brick is flowing in curves and, and the bricks are all molded to, to smoothly flow with those curves. And then you, you have rough cut stone, but at the, at the, the, the points of emphasis, the points of highlight, you have things such as a, a very medieval influences such as faces and things like that that are, that are uh, you know, uh, that the ornament the building. Very, very limited in the ornament. And you can see other shots of it. I mean, building is, is, is you know, this, like I said, outstanding. The uh, Rural Memorial Chapel, also at Gettysburg College, this was built in 1889, uh, the cost of about $15,400. There you can see a much more typical layout, though, even in the main auditorium, you're still laying, entering this corner and you're laying this out where there's a stage here, but if you were, you're, you're putting your long axis this way, your short axis is towards the speaker, which is bringing you closer to the speaker. Um, the axe itself there then becomes just overflow seating, um, you know, second auditorium. I believe this was a music building. Um, or had become a music building um, after it would no longer serve as a chapel. Um, again, you see the JA the signature stone there. And Central Market in New York, everybody's familiar with that. Again, a Richardson, Richardson Romanesque style building, but much more stripped down in detail than some of the other buildings. Um, very more similar to Stevens School and some of those in the way it's detailed in the Collegiate Institute, some of the more um, uh, the, more expensive, more sophisticated buildings. This is the Mutual Insurance Company building in Frederick, Maryland. And I'm going to point out that you can start to see there's going to be some trends that happen in kind of these office buildings over time. You can start to see an organization develop where you're starting to see a vertical emphasis in the building. Whereas rather than kind of a horizontal emphasis, you're starting to see this kind of thing happening where this is becoming a bay, that's kind of becoming a bay. And you're seeing these other basically um, mixtures of various European styles starting to, to happen and with the Mansard group and everything occurring here. But again, the European influence starting to come in with the training of uh, Reinhardt and some of the other architects. But this vertical emphasis, start paying attention to how that changes over the years. Another one was, the, that's another 
photo of the mutual insurance company. The Freisinger store in residence in York that still stands. Again, same kind of Romanesque details. Um, this is the Rockville National Bank. Um, it's similar to um, a number of banks that Dumpwolf did in um, Towson and Delta. And you can see, we'll, we'll see how some of these styles and some of the basic design was taken and recycled over time. This building no longer stands. So the photo of it sometime in the, the 1950s, not very well maintained before it was demolished. This was a Towson National Bank, which was in the center of Towson. Um, again, kind of taking, this building had more of the early Victorian Gothic detail as we saw. This one is transforming more to Richardson Romanesque and you see many of the same types of details and treatment that happened in Calvert Church, which this, this building. And then later yet yeah, in 1895, uh, six, seven, eight years later, you see the same kind of bank design recycled um, with the First National Bank in Delta, but you see much more um, Elizabethan and um, medieval kind of use of styles in this building. You see change in style art. Um, this was a Citizens National Bank in the first building built in 1860, 1886, 1888, Frederick, Maryland. The interesting thing about this is very interesting mid 19th century Gothic style that you have on the corner of a major intersection, center of town, you have the Chateau-esque turret. And you'll see this happen over and over again from the Colonial Hotel on the square here to um, other buildings that use this became a stylistic feature. Now this building you can see is broken more horizontally. It doesn't have that vertical emphasis that later became very prevalent in tall buildings and you will see later happen in a lot of depth of buildings. Is a photo of the, um, the Citizens National Bank building. In York, um, this was the HA 1887, the HA Ebert Store and Office Building. Um, this was in the area around where the Corey's building now stands. Um, what was the Corey's building, um, which is kind of the blue Art Deco building on, on East Market Street, excuse, yeah, West Market Street, excuse me, stands. And you see the same kind of step dormer detail that occurred in this building. And another building that center of town that had the, the turret um, was the Aldine Hotel in Spring Grove. Here's a more recent shot of it uh, with um, later renovations in it as porches. Again, the very little ornament the gate, you know, is in the organic stuff is happening. Again, kind of a mixture of chateau-esque and you know, medieval and Tudor revival styles, very kind of eclectic. And then of course, there's the Colonial Hotel in York, which is very much more Chateau-esque in its whole composition. Like probably the, the larger one where you, uh, you know, the most dramatic one where you have um, this, this turret that, that rose up seven floors on the square in York, but became kind of a focal center point of the, of the intersection where it was. And again, you see these, these punctuated dormers, which are in these Gothic dormers, which are a stylistic thing that you saw we used over and over in some of the buildings. The rock building, again, blended in style, again, by the Dempel firm, but um, not, it looks like it would be part of that same building, but it's not. And then in um, 1906, 1908, excuse me, there was an addition to the building, which doubled the size of it. This is the only one with the, the seven, the sixth and seventh floors remaining intact on the building. Um, there had been a fire, for those of you who aren't aware of it, in this part of the building. And the, um, actually, I think it was down at the fourth floor and burned up through in the, around 1947 that <clears throat> burned this off and they, they took it off and it never rebuilt it. There is one of the JAD stones right here at this alley on this building in 1914. And then you can see later renovations to the building as the entrances were shifted to the back part. And then these became storefronts. They, there were, were things in the Dempel building of, of remodeling in the 1920s. So it's unknown if that involved changing uh, all of this lobby to storefronts, that kind of thing. And the shifting of the lobby to the back. Then we talked about the Rupp building. <clears throat> that was built in 1892 at a cost of $39,250. Um, it's 
stylistic, very similar to the colonial hotel. But again, you still have this breakup. It's, you have these Romanesque elements, and you're starting to get some verticality with the height of the building here, but you're basically dividing this in bands by, by basement at the top story. So the bare face on the square, which people point out. This is the, in 1888, it's a published design for the F. Campbell House in Stable, New York. And then the George M. Jones House in Stable in 1889 in Greensburg. So you can see how they work. We're starting to work all over the state and you can see similarities <clears throat> in these designs. And then the uh, uh, William O. Gladfellow residence in Spring Grove in 1887. Lost some of its porches on this side. <clears throat> and then, of course, the J.A. Dumpel residence. This is an earlier picture before the recent kind of facade restoration, and some of the retained it. But I always thought it was interesting to compare, and we will compare this later with Reinhardt's houses. On you want to talk about and you want to, want to compare the difference between the stylistic preferences of the two brothers and what they liked. But you can see what would be described as the American Queen Anne influence here. Very eclectic, mixture of styles, mixture of details, very exuberant, lots of detail. Um, this is um, the C.H. Dumpel residence, which is adjacent to um, J.A.'s residence on South Ford Street, still standing. <clears throat> there were um, facade renovations, such as the alterations to this facade on East Market Street for the, the in 1880 for the George Smizer residence. And very typical of, of um, buildings at the time, uh, the uh, 1890, the Captain W. H. Landius residence in York. Some unbuilt designs, um, Gothic revival design for the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Baltimore in 1891. As far as I've been able to determine, it was never built, nor was there ever a Lutheran Theological Seminary established in Baltimore. Um, this is the, the, the mate to the Calvary Presbyterian Church in the 1880s that we talked about earlier. This is Westminster Presbyterian Church in New York, which still stands. This is a very interesting building in that the, um, you see almost Scandinavian influences in the tower. You see a completely different use and mixture of styles than you saw in some of those earlier buildings. This is similar to the Romanesque entrances, but it's has a, a uh, you know has a gothic peak arch in the center. The building is lit by it's very internal, and you're entering a corner, and it is lit by this clear story that surrounds the auditorium area <clears throat> that lights it from above, and then all of your functional spaces, your church school rooms, surround that auditorium. Area. And then the rear building, the rear education building, is always interesting because again, you're mixing, <clears throat> you know, you're mixing um, the Romanesque styles, things like these eyebrow windows and all, but it's it it's becoming very different than the front part of the building, and it's almost relating more to the industrial buildings that are right adjacent to it and surround this church. Um, St. Mark's Evangelical Lutheran Church. Um, this um, was replaced by a modern building on East Market Street that still stands. Um, this was 1890, excuse me, to 1892. More of a traditional design and layout of this building. You're still entering at the corner, but this is much more of a traditional axial relationship. But a very interesting shingle style building. And it was demolished. An unbuilt design for the Highland Inn in 1893 in New York. Um, for Highland Park, which didn't survive, I don't believe, much after the, the turn of the century, probably why the Inn was never built. And then you start to see very different changes in design. This is an 1893 design for the Lutheran Theological Seminary. It's Valentine Hall in Gettysburg. Prices have gone up. This is a $36,649 building. But you're starting to see much more use of classical elements, Georgian elements. You still has have this axe here um, for the you know the chapel area of the building, but you're you're starting to see very big changes, shape dormers and everything happening in the building. 
this building had been insensitively renovated a, a number of years ago, kind of modernized um, with the window replacements and everything. This is a, a, um, a the Sigma Chi Chapter House built in 1890 at Phillipsburg College. It's adjacent to Gladstone Hall and Brownstone still stands. And then in keeping with the changes, this was the McKnight Hall, which is the last I knew was a dormitory building built in 1890. Again, you had much more different influences with the European influences and all happening there. Shaped dormers. You can see that difference in changes and changes in styles. St. Mary's Lutheran Church in um, Silver One, Maryland, 1894. Public photos of the building. And it's interesting, you're still entering to this corner tower. And still shortening up as much as possible. You're still keeping a lot of the ornament related to the stone and some of the materials, but the style itself is, is becoming very different. And then the J.A. Eastern on this building, which was, like I said, was saved from the most important buildings. <clears throat> uh, similar on um, the similar lines, Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church in Johnstown in 1894. It's interesting, these, I'll point out these cupolas. Um, there is a uh, Lutheran church in the center of Carlisle that um, has these also. And it was, they were used as ways, uh, and again, I think you pointed out when we were at Calvary. Excuse me, Center, Center Presbyterian Church, but they were the ways of ventilating the auditorium of the building <clears throat> during, um, especially during cold weather, warm weather. Um, this was the uh, Prospect Hill Cemetery and the Mortuary Chapel, built in 1887. <clears throat> there were multiple buildings out of Prospect Hill. This one unfortunately didn't survive. Again, you can see. This is now becoming very late 19th century Gothic revival style in a, in a simple chapel. Very exquisite in a lot of details. Uh, simple Immaculate Conception Roman Catholic Church in 1901 in Oxford. Still keeping Romanesque styles, but like very simplified now. An interesting building, um, a couple of interesting buildings there would be this is the St. James Evangelical Lutheran Church in Helen. Very interesting that low budget, a lot of these details are all, are all these details are now done out of wood. They say do this was very well maintained. You have these Roman nest, but Gothicized elements happening with your windows, but then you have something very different happening in this um, colonial revival with the steeple, classical revival. And then a similar building was the St. Peter's Evangelical Lutheran Church in 1892 in North York. Um, bring this in just to show work that they did in other areas of the state. This was 1894, the Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church in the city of Allegheny, which is now part of Pittsburgh. And this is on a very compressed lot, so the building itself becomes very vertical. And then this one was the Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church built in 1904 in Monongahela. Hala. And this was interesting. And this little Gothic revival building was an early use of concrete block mason. You can see this is not stone, it's concrete block mason. And it's made to look like stone, even though the sewers in this, this window. It's how they originally made, a, made the material look like you know, a more expensive material. When I saw this, this was, a, was basically a shingle, shingle style building and it was being covered with aluminum siding. So I did get a picture of that. This goes back into the 1980s, but before they had covered the whole building. Uh, Zion Reformed Church in Spring Grove. Again, not a revival, brownstone building, but much more simpler, much different in the handling of the styles. Now we'll touch on a little bit of the Western Maryland Railroad Station. Um, this was a building that was entirely attributed to Reinhardt, according to his son. And it was very interesting in that with really the, the, you know, the French details that were incorporated through the ornamentation in all of this building. Um, it's a real loss again to York. Um, 
it's out of that probably what were three railroad stations in New York. This was by far the most elaborate one. There's a, a demo photo that was part of the uh, the Gazette and Daily Archives here. Then one of the, the later schools that were done um, was the um, Spring Grove Public School in the 1919 edition. And this building now, totally different. It's really almost an Italian building. The tower itself is almost separated from the building. And the only thing really tying it to it is this kind of enclosed porch, which becomes the entry. You still have a Roman arched entry. But you have uh, the, the tower itself almost becomes a campanile, which is separated from the building. The dormers become very squat. And then you can see what, what you're saying totally balanced and asymm asymmetrical composition, but the elements themselves totally balance that. It's a very, it was a very skillful building. And then there was an addition also done by Fred Dempwell in, uh, in around 1919. Um, unfortunately, not as sensitive, and it, it kind of destroyed some of the original character of the building. I always found the, the Griffins on here. Reinhard Dumpel's son said that his signature on buildings were lion's heads. He always liked lion's heads. So, therefore, you see a lion's head fountain at the York County Courthouse downtown. You saw lion's heads on this building. So, that's one thing to look for in some of the buildings that, if he had the chance to, that was kind of his signature that he worked on the building. An early, another uh, composition that was totally attributed to him was the um, Eichelberg Academy in Hanover in 1896. That was later expanded many, many more times. Uh, it's still standing as the, you know, the Eichelberg Center, I believe is the name, something similar to that in Hanover. But you can see this part of it, the building is still original, the wings have been, been changed with the windows over the years. Um, Elizabeth College in Charlotte, North Carolina. Again, you're starting to get much more, you know, less of kind of the organic exuberance of the Romanesque revival and much more of the state Georgian revival, classical revival elements to the building. There's a picture of this. I believe that building and that campus is demolished and bumped now. Um, comparing to some of our earlier resident, our earlier residential Queen Anne that were happening five, 10 years earlier. Now, this is the Milton Valentine residence at the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Pittsburgh. Again, starting to get very different, very classical revival in its style. And of course, the 1900 um, Charles Frick residence in York, which is at Springsbury and Beaver. Of course, the John C. Schmidt residence, shingle style in kind of its detailing. But what I find was really interesting is this one dates to 1890. And you can see by that time, they were pretty much, except for maybe different colors on the window sash, a lot of it was monochromatic. You were starting to go from that polychromatic painting and ornamentation of building to much more of a monochromatic use. The recent restoration of this made it more historical with the way it was painted it was shingle style but you can tell from this photo that if there was a change in shading it was it was, it was very subtle and not did exist at all and then george schmidt excuse me john schmidt's brother george schmidt also in 1890 <clears throat> also on south george street very different stylistic treatment um milton martin residence 1894 and you're starting to see something very different. And with these European and Dutch step donors and everything else happening, again, a mixture of, of eclectic styles. And the Elias Grove re residence in 1899, again, taking kind of that Dutch step dormer thing, applying again. Um, the MB Spa residence in 1895 in York. You have these elements like these plating windows, you have kind of an asymmetry happening with the building. At the Philip Spa residence, the additions to the residence, including this turret. And then the, this, this whole row on North Queen Street, um, the Nathan Lehmeyer residence, again, high school revival styles. And at the end, the Fort Laux residence, which was his um, city residence at the time, again, with the Dutch Manson group and the Dutch set former styles. 
1901, the Lemon Lobby W. R. Thompson residence in New York. Again, you're seeing these shaped dormitories, you're seeing a very different treatment and mixture of styles. George W. Ryan residence, 1899, and similar era, the original York Country Club, which stood where York College now stands. This almost total to revival in style. And you see those English medieval revival elements happening in the design for this house. But the Country Club, very similar to the um, um, Prospect Hill Gate Lodge, which was built for you here. Your country club was 1900, Prospect Hill Cemetery Gate Lodge was in 1903. And then the stable buildings, stylistically keeping the same style, style in 1901. And then this is interesting in the PH Gladfather residence, also in 1901, they took a very similar, simple farmhouse and added these kind of Gothic and true revival elements, including these simple columns. If you look at this building, um, that are a simplified version of an arch column that show over and over again on that point of buildings. Uh, Weimhardt contributed his classical training um, to various buildings uh, that were much more literal in their the classical interpretation. 1900, the Centennial Arches in New York. Of course, the York County Courthouse. And I often point out to people that the, the more original facade is this back, as opposed to the, the front facade, which unfortunately had been covered with paint brick, and then the, the wings expanded in, uh, you know, a not totally sensitive treatment to it in the 1950s. But you can see what the original color of the building was, which was, again, the color of palette very in keeping with the stylistic of the time that was built in the rear. <clears throat> this is an interesting design for the Hartford County Courthouse in Delaware, Maryland. And they basically took what was a early Ita earlier Italian building from the 1870s, and they added these wings onto it, which had a little more Georgian influence, certainly changed the steeple, certainly changed with this entrance, and you will see this kind of happen on other temple buildings. And they kind of took that building and kind of married these wings on either side of it, completely changing the look of the building and the style of the building, doing it in a very sophisticated way. <clears throat> and then the same kind of entrance pattern showed again on the Franklin School building in York, which was built in 1901. You can see another shot of it here at the Harvard County Courthouse. And then similar then in the styles at the turn of the century in 1901, 1912, the York Hospital and Dispensary, this being the older building which no longer survives, but then this being 1900, 1902 buildings. Again, you can see the squat dormers. Um, Pool Engineering Machine Company, also in stylistic keeping in these buildings in 1903 in New York. This, or, excuse me, in Baltimore. This is, is visible off um, I-83 in the Woodbury area of Baltimore as you're, you're heading south. It would be on the associated building on the right. <clears throat> Talk a little bit about some of the department store buildings that they did. Um, this was the P. Weiss and Sons store and office building in 1890 <clears throat> with alterations in 1895. Notice the treatment here of goods and the only kind of vertical influences you have to maybe the tying together of these two stories. But then by um, early 1909, you start to see very different things starting to happen. The Rosenmilla Building, High School Revival, Gazette Building, High School Revival, all kinds of keeping with each other. And then I was going to talk to you really quickly about the Chicago style and Adler and Sullivan. This is where you start to see in the use of tall buildings that I've been mentioning, you'll start to see more of a vertical treatment happening with buildings over time. Um, these are 1887, 1880, 1898 happening in Chicago. Here where you're not seeing so much of it, you're starting to see a little bit of it, but then later you're seeing that kind of evolve and some of that detailing until you get to this kind of thing where you're really emphasizing the height and the verticality of the building and the alteration of the, of the, of the sides. 
So you start to see that happen, and you're starting to see opening up with this, this three part Chicago style picture window to get more light into the interiors and ventilations. And it, ventilation. And then this is the um, Schlesinger and Meyer apartment store, 1899 and 1902 in Chicago, which was kind of a groundbreaking building. And so you start to see some of that happening here. Earlier designs, um, People's Bank, um, First National Bank, in very classic revival. You don't see a lot of that happening. But you're starting to see kind of bay windows and things like that happen in this building. And you're starting to see by the time the, the, um, <clears throat> the Gailey building is built in 1889, um, you're starting to see this vertical emphasis where now rather than just part of the building, you're starting to almost tie the whole building above the base is the one emphasizing the height. Same with floor building, you know, you're interrupting it by the bay, you kind of have this flow. And then <clears throat> you're starting to see the Chicago School influence in the department store occurring here in York. This was the <clears throat> Bears department store in 1911, again, happening several years after the Schlesinger and Meyer in Chicago by about a decade. But you're seeing this Chicago style picture window, you're seeing great practice in the building. And of course, one of the more grander ones was the Brumbacher um, Bonton building in 18, um, also in 1911. <clears throat> I throw this one in um, because of the recent renovations on the, the Bond building. This was the front building for the Anderson Motor Company building in 1921. Um, that is where the parking lot in front of the, the Bond building is today. <clears throat> this is an early design for what is that Bond building. This is, is all that is really standing there today. This was, was built. Something like that that was demolished. So you can see this is the part of the building still standing. And then to um, show some of the industrial buildings and some of the changes in that, in, in those over the years, um, this was the York Card and Paper Company in 19, 1894, the Diamond Silk Mill in 1900, <clears throat> again, really defined by these, these towers, which still become skyline elements of York. There's the Ford's renovation. And then by 1921, the Miller Safe Company in Baltimore, you're seeing a very completely different style in that you're seeing these banks of glass and um, steel windows that are providing maximum light into the interiors of these buildings. Very change over the, the punched opening look and changing technology of the earlier buildings. And then touching on, we're getting towards the end here, um, <clears throat> one of the greatest residential complexes that they did was the East and West Hill residence of um, PH and William L. Gladfeller and Spring Grove. This is a gatehouse building which still stands. And then this was a shot that was, was published nationally um, in a magazine, an architectural magazine, that shows a panoramic view of buildings together. And you can see the plans of the house. The, um, I think that was the West House, the East House, and the the servants' quarters connected to houses still stand. This building gradually burned down in a fire um, in the late eight, 1980s, I believe, early 1990s, and was never replaced. So you don't have that, that drama of that building anymore. But again, this is a much more traditional, stylistically correct interpretation of the Gothic inspired styles that were being done for. Um, during the late Gilded Age and for the, the, the high-end residences and the industrial barons at the time. So a lot of this kind of thing in, in mainline Pennsylvania, very little of it here. There's some of the details of the building. Two interior shots from the published, ma published magazine. The Gardner's Cottages still stand. And then a very interesting design, and this supposedly was a was a credited to a friendship that um, uh, Fred Devil made with William McKinley, uh, Johnson McKinley's son, excuse me, in um, Europe. And this is the McKinley residence, Willow Glen, built in 1914 in Newland, West Virginia. And this is very interesting that it's in the side of a mountain. There used to be a, a coal mine that went into the basement behind the mountain, which is how they heated the house. Um, they just took it out of the mountain right into the basement of the house. And this becomes very interesting in that 
it's almost similar to a lot of things that the Kim and White were doing at the time. And you took you you took a very classical inspired design, but you um, you marry it to its site. There's a long winding road that comes up around the house, and you come around the mountain is up here, and you enter this side of the house. So you really come around the garden sides of the house, and you enter on the dark side, the back of the house. You have this big oval shaped reception hall that marries with this seven sided um, dining room. And that becomes the break between the two wings, kind of the service wing and the living wings of the, of the residence. Very ingenious design. Now you can see an aerial shot I was able to find at the house. The last thing that still stood, I, um, you know, I'm not certain how well preserved it is. There are some shots proceeding up around the driveway, and the views of it today is you're proceeding up the hill towards the house. And you come around the entrance side of the house, which is back in here, and that is the entrance. Look at that detail. We'll see that show again. And then, of course, the um, the Krepler residence, the R.W. Emerton residence of York, <clears throat> later known as the Han Home, now Cooner and Associates, um, very well maintained now since uh, Cooner has had it. Um, very interesting Elizabethan revival style. Again, very very similar to what was very popular at that time. The original owners only lived in this. They built it around 1916, only lived in it till 1921. The rumor was that they had invested, um, Emerton had invested all of his um, money in war armaments um, under the assumption that World War I would continue longer than it did. It didn't. They invested around 1918, they didn't end it shortly after that. And so he lost that investment. And by 1921, the Dumpwald, um, logs recorded converting this into the Krepler apartments. <clears throat> I have some of the original um, drawing room photos with the stair. All this had been last in when it was, uh, it was the Han home residence. <clears throat> and some original interior shots of the, of the house. Some of which are preserved, some of which have been changed over the years. Original stairs. And I think part of that remains public calling. I think part of it has been altered to accessibility over the years. Lion's Head, talked about. And then see the fountain. Same thing that happened in West Virginia a couple of years later, the same kind of fountain detail happening on these houses. So you'll see the same kind of thing, you know, some of these kind of signature details used over and over again. <clears throat> the Jackson Theater that we know is the Capitol Theater. Reinhard Duffel of Sun. Um, also, John Deppel, John Arnold Deppel, it kind of expressed to me when I interviewed him in the early 1980s that the, his father sort of thought that this facade was his greatest work. This was the kind of thing he was trained to do, the kind of thing that is very formal classical revival facade, the kind of thing that he liked to do, the kind of thing he probably would have done a lot of had he gone with Whitney Warren and, you know, Going into practice with Whitney Warren in New York, but had very little opportunity to do it here. And then this is a late picture of a Dunkel firm in the 1920s. You can see a much older J.A. Dunkel. You can see a much older Reinhardt Dunkel there. Harry Lanker, who was probably the last well known architect to come out of that office, um, he went on to be known for the AAA building, the Lynch Ballroom, um, I think the Viking Club in West York. Um, the many school buildings, including Dever School and its original configuration, um, were all higher Lincoln buildings, very much into to modernist design. Samuel Gensler, who's a part of the photo, was a, uh, was a secretary, or guy in a but much smaller office. One of the last um, commissions in J.A.'s life, again, very classical revival, is a simple St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Harrisburg. Redline First National Bank, which is not so well preserved anymore. I think it's lost its corner so long as detail. And then two um, sister churches um, in, in a early 20th century Gothic revival style. And you can see how the styles of the Gothic interpretation have changed with programmatic changes in the different eras and, and from um, 50 years earlier when Dunkel started to do them. 
but this is Memorial Evangelical Lutheran Church in Harrisburg, and of course Union Evangelical Lutheran Church in York. Also, the prices of these, if you've been following some of that, this was a $253,000 plus project. This was a $279,000, this is a $280,000 project. It's more of, of, of Union Lutheran and a Memorial Lutheran. These were done, again, 1926. In 1926, on December 24th, J.A. died. The firm then became F.G. Demwolf Architect. Um, it further, from what I understand, kind of um, exacerbated the rift between the two branches of the family. Um, the, as I understand, Reinhardt never felt he got his do in the firm that it should have been Duffel and Duffel. He should have had more recognition for what he did in his contribution to the firm. Um, his son expressed that they all he always felt he was underpaid, he was underappreciated. And then when J.A. died, it became Fred Dempel, F.G. Dempel, architect. So then Reinhardt gradually finished up his career and started to move towards retirement. Uh, 1928 was the Box Hill Whiteley residence. And at that time, believe it or not, it was $152,576.64. Didn't you, you work, didn't you work there? That's coming back to me now. You talked about that. That was one of your summer jobs. Yeah. When first, she still lived there. Yeah, when Mrs. White lived there. Yeah, yeah. See, I, I, I forgot all about that. And then one of the last ones, which shows you the, just the stylistic capabilities of these architects um, and really of Reinhardt, one of the, one of the last buildings was the 1930 York Telephone and Telegraph office building in, on um, South Beaver Street in York. And again, Art Deco provided and stuff completely different. You still have these very beautiful sculptural ornament, ornamental sculptural panels happening. And then you can see the, you know, the influence that, that Reinhardt had to have even in the, you know, the door um, surround casings. And I would imagine at one time it may have been backlit and then these were interior shots that I was able to get in the 80s. I have no idea if any of that even survived before all that was closed to the public. <clears throat> what was very interesting and what was very typical of Art Deco is you see these classical revival elements, but then they're, they're interpreted now for the machine era. Stainless steel capitals and, and the way the ornamentation is, is much more crisper and sharp in its, its, its detailing. Again, it gives you the stylistic capability of Reinhardt and what he was able to do. Just really quickly, Reinhardt's houses. Um, this was um, the East Philadelphia Street alterations to the uh, Goodrich House. Um, this facade and basically the interiors as they exist now were altered by Reinhardt Duffel. Um, I'm not sure of the exact date, but it would have been very late 19th, early 20th century era. His son describes at the time, you know, and remembers, you know, some of the Underground Railroad um, things that they had uncovered within the walls and everything, but a lot of that wasn't preserved because it wasn't a thing they even thought of preserving at the time. Pretty much the facade of the house is, is, is Reinhardt temples, including the pitch of the roof and everything that was all at the time. So Reinhardt re, um, built his retirement home in 1930, right, on the, the beginning of the Depression which still sits, unfortunately, it's been very, very badly altered within the last few years um, on the hill above uh, the Queens Gate Shopping Center, which was, was part of their land. These gray colors weren't original uh, from what his son described, that, that um, uh, tannish color that, uh, and creamish color that the building is painted now are more original than the original colors, but the, the alterations of the building have really kind of destroyed the facades of it. But you can see much more difference. Now, we're in a very different era than the 1880s when J.A. built this out. But you can see a very different type of stylistic preference between the brothers of what one does for his houses and what the other one did for his. Touch on a little bit quick of what Fred is known for. Pretty much after the Depression, and Reinhardt's retirement, um, Fred Dempel um, operated a very small office. A lot of times, only one person, two person or so um, 
firm really up until his death around 1970. I mentioned the architect Bill Dyes. He wouldn't die if anybody knew him. Um, had worked for um, Fred Dempel really after World War II in the 1950s and 60s, and then kind of inherited basically the, the small practice from Fred. And then Bill continued that as a one man practice for the rest of his life. Um, one of the notable commissions in 1935 was the Martin Memorial Library. Very, um, very colonial revival in its influences, but, but very interesting in that it, it, it plays with that style. It, 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 very, it does it in a very sophisticated manner. In 1941 was the old York City Hall, which is now the police building, um, which replaced the St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church, which was the building that inspired J.A. J. A., but was set on fire and burned down by an arsonist, I think sometime around 1939, 1940. This building then was built on that site. And then this is very typical of the colonial revival that was becoming very popular at the time. Um, this one is attributed to Robert A. Stair, um, who also came out of the Dempwolf office and then with Fred Dempwolf. And then Fred had died in February 4th, 1970. And like I said, after pretty much after this, he did various residences, small projects, that kind of thing. Uh, really after the depression, other than a few of these notable works, the firm and their work kind of kind of dwindled down. So any questions, anything anybody wants to, to discuss or ask? No, any questions about the faces on the Black Elder Hall? Mm -hmm. Do they have any significance where they myth mythology? That creatures or what were the Reinhardt's trying to depict themselves or I mean I, the death I, I would doubt that it's depicting themselves. I would think that they either are faces of academic people, people notable in literature, maybe even founders of that college. It would be interesting to know it's something I've never had the time to dig into. But if you know there are any records at Gettysburg College of what they are, I would doubt very much they I don't know them to have depicted themselves. I don't think they were that, um, especially Reinhardt, I'm sure was not that self-centered from everything that's been told to me about him, but yeah. So, yeah. One question on Facebook uh, is asking if you published a book on the Dunkle. <laughs> no, some people have told me I should. Uh, maybe that's a retirement project sometime. I'm, I'm open to, um, you know, ghostwriters. So if anybody has that interest, uh, you know, and it's, it's one of those things that there's a lot of, of material still out there. There's, you know, I mean, it, how you focus down a book becomes the challenge. And do you make it all like a general compendium and catalog that you add to as you find more stuff? Or do you, because there's no exhaustive list. I mean, you have the drawing collection, which came from Bill Dyes, but that's not complete. And some of the more notable buildings, Bill would, would give stuff away. Like the central market drawings were part of that collection when I saw him and saw them in his office in the AAA building when I was doing this research in the early 1980s. But a few years later, he'd given them away to the market. So, you know, so things disappeared over time. And then there is a, a, um, is a book that lists project and costs that somebody typed up. But again, that's not complete either. And that's in your, your was in your files. I had a, a scan of it, a copy of it. Again, there's nothing that is kind of definitive if they didn't keep those kind of records. And really, if, if it's a, an active firm that, um, you know, I can understand, you know, even just having been at it for 25 years, how, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's done that's not tracked. So, yeah. One more question from uh, Zoom. Did Reinhardt do all of the carvings on the exterior of the J.A. residence? J.A.'s residence? That, I don't know. I would, I think we can make an assumption that <clears throat> he was local, he had a talent, his brother would have, everything I've been told, his brother would have used that talent. Um, his brother was a very shrewd business person. So yes, if Reinhardt was available to contribute towards it, his uh, Reinhardt's son, John Armour Deppel, told me a story <clears throat> when they were renovating Christ Lutheran Church. I'm not sure the exact dates, but it would have been the early 20th century at some point. And the current lectern in there has an angel. And I understand that lectern is still there. And <clears throat> some of those, some of you who may be more familiar with the church would be able to confirm that. 
the, the, the carving of the angel on the lectern, um, the, the gentleman, the, the carver originally doing it wasn't having too much success with it. So um, John Armadale Wolf said, you know, his father had taken him to the job site that day and was very dissatisfied with the way this angel was looking. As a matter of fact, he said he described that it was looking more like a peanut vendor than an angel. <laughs> and I remember that quote, I remember it. And so his father said, you know, said to the, the carver, just give me your tools, go home. And that, um, you know, and he sent John home. And so he sent home and he worked on it for some time through that evening or whatever. And that angel that's on that lectern is, is carved. So yes, he did have those skills and did do that kind of thing. Is Reinhardt the one that primarily did the old courthouse? Probably, yes. Yeah, especially given the styles and everything in that building. Um, J.A., a lot of, lot, he, and if you look like in Prowl's history and everything, you'll see that he was on just about every board and corporation in town. And he, he had switched to, which a lot of times really happens with, you know, senior partners and firms. He was the one who, had the social connections, got the jobs, was everywhere around town. And as kind of John Armour expressed to me, there wasn't anything that went out of the office that he didn't have a comment on. But especially after the 1880s, mid 1880s, he would have been more of the business development person, the marketing person running it and commenting on things, contributing to some degree. But especially those high-end classical revival buildings would have been exactly what Reinhardt was trained in. And that was not J.A.'s interest. And are the domes, are they inspired by the Bernalesque dome in Florence? Yeah, I would think so. Yep. Yep. I don't know any direct evidence where they talked about that. It's interesting, things like the, the Franklin School. There is there's a writing by Reinhardt Dempel that was published in one of the York papers. I have a copy of it but it had to do with the architecture of York. It was published sometime around um, 1900 to 1910. I don't remember the exact date, but it had to do, he talked about the evolution of York's architecture from the colonial era to the early 20th century and from obscurity to sophistication. And he talked about some of those buildings. There, is a writing in, and he, and he even complimented some of the, um, the you know, competitors, which is B.F. Willis that did a lot of the school work, like the old York High School, Hannah Penn, that kind of thing. And he, um, but he, he talked about some of these buildings. And then there's a writing, which he probably did on the, um, in the school catalog with that published photo of Franklin School and when that was done. And today, preservation of this would describe as colonial revival early 19th, 20th, 19th, 20th century colonial revival. But they called it American Renaissance is how he referred to it as a style of that building. So they kind of, they didn't, you know, historians kind of peg hole things and they were just seeing things and, oh, this is interesting. Let's see what we can do blending this and that together. And that's kind of what they were doing. This is popular. So let's take it yeah, and using their skills and do that. One more question on Wong. Uh, are there plans for JA's residence in existence? You'd have to check the, your catalog. If there, if it's not there, there aren't. I think there was something in there for his residence. But yeah, if you do a search of the, the Dempel of collection, you'll be able to tell. If it's not there, I'm sure there's. In that era, things didn't you're not going to find houses that old that you're going to find a roll of drawings laying around an attic because they didn't exist. They were done on linen and in full-size details, even up into the 1950s, I was told by architects that worked then were done on brown paper. So a lot of times the architects would do it on brown paper on the floor and they do the window details and everything else. And those will go directly to the mill or the job site. So they never survive. So you'd have a very kind of simple linen drawings yeah, everyone had to be early on. Everybody had everyone had to be drafted for as many copies as you wanted, and they went to the job site 
and they probably survived due to what they were on. That's what you see in your collection, but the, the details in those kind of sheets didn't. So you wouldn't find much of the house, you'd find a little bit of it. Okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, I guess the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>